in that image. They miss a lot of the information on the sides. Imagine when you're tired, when you've been looking at this for the whole day, how difficult it is. And if you have eyes, like I do, then there are also challenges. So, if a tumor is a black spot in this image, can anyone count the number of tumors? <laughs> when your heart beats, motion is very important. So, are these hearts beating or not? It depends. Yeah, they're beating. <laughs> or, if you read the Washington Post magazine, like I do, you see something that is called uh, uh, change blindness. Finding out little changes between two images that are full of texture can be difficult. But this is what the difference in those kinds. I don't know if anybody's seen something fast over here, but there, I think there are 12 changes. I, mean, I remember that one over here. And so on and so forth. <laughs> We're not going to go to them today. But to show you actually a real uh, uh, medical image data. Can anyone spot the difference between the left and the right? And it's a simulated tumor. And I'm already giving you a hint. There is a simulated tumor over there. With that knowledge, how is it easy to find it? Because tumors are masters of disguise. One, two, and three. Now that I'm showing you the location, how is it easy to find it? So finding context in medical images can be complicated, but once we have that kind of information, it's easy. So, I'll make the first proposition for the evening. Medicine is an art. Who believes in that? I mean, I, I know I'm at IEEE, but medicine is an art. Any, any hands raised? <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, uh, absolutely. But this is why we all want to go and see the best specialist when you go to a hospital, right? Because medicine comes with experience and with a lot of knowledge. Well, so is Jackson Pollock. When he, uh, he painted, I think this is number 52, there was a lot of texture in there. And what I'm showing you this image is because what we see in medical images very often has that much texture and information and how do we extract what's important in it and how do we ignore the rest. So, in medicine, in clinical practice, very often measurements in images are manual, which are very variable and take a lot of time. Very expensive as well. But now go back and think about the thousands of uh, slices that I was showing you in a computer tomograph over there. Nobody wants to do that. Variability is important as well, because when you see somebody who's sick, the anatomy is unusual, and there is pathology in it. So, medicine is science. Any takers on that? Sure. <laughs> yeah, here we should have unanimity. <laughs> and uh, just like I showed you, right, with the Journal of Obesity, objective scientific facts make better informed clinical decisions. And this is what quantitative imaging comes really in practice. To complement the clinician with precise information that is personalized also, increase safety and anticipate events because knowing something earlier and precisely can actually save lives. Also decrease costs, which is something that is not to be ignored in uh, clinical practice because that increases uh, access to um, clinical facilities uh, to, to many people. So, modeling and automation is something you'd hear from me again tonight, but also artificial intelligence. These are definitely tools that we can use in quantitative imaging and many other applications. And when I started doing research in medical imaging, I was very interested in what the eye does. Because when you work with images, you want to extract something as well as the eye. That's probably a good standard. But again, the eye here, I'm showing you three rectangles of exactly the same color, or exactly the same gray value, with different bright backgrounds. And this is something that the eye knows how to adapt to. We see them differently because we have what's called foveal adaptation. We learn from the background how to see better what's in, in, in the foreground. <clears throat> and the good news is that this adaptation can be written in a mathematical formula just like this, which is some kind of an adapted thresholding. And that's how, again, using quantitative imaging, we can start helping computers to work like clinicians by uh, just mathematical formulations. I also want to show you what's another clinical challenge in, in medical imaging, and this is coming from the perspective of a radiologist. When you get some of the medical image data, 
there's normally some kind of exposure and source and energy which can be variable from machine to machine, from manufacturer to manufacturer. So images don't necessarily look the same of the same person if you acquire them on different machines. Then, data gets recorded somewhere. Right now everything is pretty much digital and that's, that's helping with that variability. But then we look at the display. If we put an image on a screen and we increase brightness and the, the contrast on it, we see things differently. This is what helps to have a coordination between the eye and brain of the clinician to detect, first of all, that there is something going on in that image and finally to recognize through the connections in the brain what is actually the pathology or the lack of pathology in, in, in that image. So it all boils down pretty much to what's happening in the clinician's brain, which is, of course, knowledge that is very useful for us as uh, researchers. So, when we know about the clinical need, we work with the best of those clinicians. So this is the art in medicine. Work with the finest and learn from them. <coughs> Pick their brain, process their brain, feed it into a machine, and obtain more of a hybrid version where half is clinician and half is uh, computer. And I think there is actually this synergy between the two groups, and here I group the MDs, and on the other side I have the PhDs, that makes medicine to be both art and science. And I'm going to show you this brain a few more times, just in case you forget uh, during my talk that this is really something that you have the two extremes, if I can call it like that, and I like to say that the truth is somewhere, somewhere in the middle. And very briefly to tell you about big data opportunities that are in medical imaging is that we see now billions of images that are stored. Unfortunately, it's not that easy to always get access to that, but data exists over there. The knowledge is curated because all of these images have been seen by clinicians. We learn what means sick and healthy because to identify disease, you have first to understand what is healthy and in my field, some of the buzzwords are radiomics, which is really extraction of features. When you have here lots and lots of people, how do you understand what is different and at the same time common between these populations? And artificial intelligence really helps making those differences. <clears throat> so, what I will show you by the end of this talk is how we can use quantitative imaging to do screening for health conditions to make better clin clinical decisions, and how to teach computers, again, to work like a clinician. And before I move into the next section, if anybody has any questions or at any point, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Yeah? <coughs> so, computational anatomy. <coughs> I will define it as the mathematical definition of anatomical shape, appearance, and variability. This is a simplified uh, a definition of it, but you'll see uh, what I mean by it. Already I told you that <clears throat> we can do interpretation of large amounts of data, but this is something that is very unique to medical images and we don't see often in image analysis or in other fields. We have anatomical and physiological constraints because we know how the human body is formed. So everybody should have the liver on the lower right side. If your liver is somewhere else, that's a big, big problem, right? We all have the same anatomy, although we have many differences between us. But this is also something that clinicians learn, and this is something that a radiologist trains for four years in the United States, right, before they, uh, they can uh, perform their work. And if we look at the abdominal imaging, and I'll start with that, because this is something that will just give you a little bit of a context of the work. This is a computed tomography slice, somewhere in the middle of the abdomen, where we see different organs. Up, this is the liver over here, this is the spleen, we have the two kidneys, the pancreas, the stomach, and, and, and so on. So for each one of these organs now, we know something about their location and their appearance. The first thing is we know where the liver is located. I'm, I'm going to exemplify these things on the liver because this is the largest organ. It's, it's easier to, to, to show you how work is done. We get lots of livers from lots of people and we compute a probabilistic atlas. This is all built, you see here the ribs and the uh, vertebrae. 
that helps us normalizing the data. But then in here, if we have a very strong color, that means here's a 100% probability that your liver sits there, much less you see around the, uh, the contours because sometimes you have a left lobe that can be uh, shorter or longer. And the good news, this can be very easily written as a probability. The next thing is shape. Again, the liver looks a bit like a liver, but there, there are differences between populations. What is the simplest definition of shape? We look at the contours here and we see where they intersect, when we're inside one or inside the other, when we're outside both, and so on. What is used more often in um, uh, imaging now is the idea of statistical shape model. And what this little video shows you here is the normal shape and size of the liver in a healthy population. So you see how much differentiation you, we can see between uh, the, the different patients. The liver can be much smaller, much larger, going to the left or shrinking to, to the right, but this is still a sign that the liver is healthy. This is again something that can be written in a mathematical form. Appearance, now we look at medical images, and particularly with computer tomography, it's everything that is inside that image has a value that is specific to, let's call it, the density of, uh, of, of uh, the tissue. So, if we look at soft tissue organs, such as the liver, and we take a CT without any contrast agent, we see here a big peak in the area of the soft tissue. If we insert contrast, which is often happening in um, uh, the clinical uh, work, you get an IV with a contrast that runs through your arteries, washes to the organs, and comes back to the veins. But if you look over here, and I don't know if you see it, you start seeing, for instance, that the tumor sits in the middle of the, of the kidney, which is not visible without the contrast. That's the value of that. But what happens with the intake of contrast into soft tissue, so everywhere where there is vasculature, you see the peak of the histogram moving to the right. Well, we can use that again, <clears throat> thinking about what I call here background. If you have bones and fat inside the body, those are not you know, intaking a lot of contrast because they don't have a lot of blood vessels. So the histogram of the so-called background here stays pretty much the same with and without the contrast. How can this be written simply? Again, as a probability. <clears throat> so, as I just mentioned earlier, you have here, you have a bone that doesn't intake any contracts. If you know that you don't want the bone, you penalize that. If you want to look for something like the liver or the kidney, you see a lot of contracts coming in, so you don't penalize that. And that's basically a four-dimensional gradient. Last but not least, as we learned in this application, the last thing that we thought about is that actually the liver should not be on top of the kidney and vice versa. So we also added the condition that two organs cannot coexist at the same location, right? So it's very simple, but it was the last thing we thought about. So now that we have all this formulation, we use something called graph cuts, which is a way to optimize several formulations through a graph representation of an image. This is a very simple example here. If we have an image that is made of mainly blue and red uh, dots, we see how blue or how red everything is in, in this image and then how big the contrast between two squares is. And then we make a cut where the cost to make that cut based on these energies is, is the smallest. This, uh, um, this theory is actually using two types of energies. One, how blue or red you are, and the other one, how much difference is between squares, uh, the squares. But in our case, we can also use the same theory to put all the equations that I showed you earlier together. So if you write it down, and this is not exhaustive, it looks a little bit like this. This is what I showed you on the previous slides. But the great thing about the graph cuts is the optimization is done all together. So we know we have the most likely shape to be a liver, the most likely position to be a liver, the most likely appearance to be a liver, and so on. And why is it important? Because then when you apply this and you have here a CT image, remember you have thousands of them going on the screen. Here I'm showing you just a selection of those slices. 
we get automatically segmented the liver, the spleen, and the kidneys. So now we know their volumes, we know their shapes. These are all important for um, um, analysis in, in, in the clinic. We get some errors as well. Here is where we see a little bit of white. This is not perfect, in perfect agreement with, with the radiologist, but it's actually quite, quite good. But I showed you those four organs because here is again the CT image. Here is the liver, here's the spleen, these are the kidneys. These are bigger organs, are, have better defined shapes, but when it comes to something like the pancreas, which we see over here, the pancreas looks a little bit like Cape Cod. It's got a head, a body, and a tail. This can move in the organ. The contrast enhancement is not as good as in, in, in the rest. How can we learn how to segment the pancreas better? Because that method didn't work well by knowing what's happening to its neighboring organs. So we take all of our organs, we look at their shapes, and we analyze how they interact with each other. And now here is the pancreas. This is called the uh, uh, canonical correlation analysis. Look at, if we look at the pancreas, we see that it actually interacts very strongly with the liver, then interacts well with the two kidneys, but also moderately with the gallbladder, with the stomach, and the spleen. And we know this, this about every organ in the abdomen, everything that we studied here, and how they relate to the neighbors. So this first, that helps us to create a better probabilistic atlas. Here is the pancreas. I showed you the probabilistic atlas of the liver before. It looked like a liver. If I show this of the pancreas, it looks like a mess. Same of the gallbladder. This should look like a sphere, more or less. It's, again, a mess. If we infer information from it, their neighbors, here are the liver, the spleen, for instance, the pancreas is starting to look much more like that organ, elongated and thin, with a head and a tail, and the gallbladder is looking much more like a ball. But then there is more. I'm going back to statistical shape models and what I showed you before, what was the variation in the healthy liver. We do the same with the spleen, and then we use the correlation between the organs to define better where the shape and the size of the pancreas, of the kidneys, of the gallbladder, and anything else that we want to add into this. So now, the restrictions that we have in the definitions that our algorithms are using for segmenting the pancreas are restricted by their neighbors. So, everything that gets put back together, and I showed you how we were doing an initial segmentation, we do probabilistic atlas, now we have this multi-level, multi-organ statistical shape model, we go back to the graph cuts, and uh, we segment the pancreas as you see it in, uh, in, in this image. But this helps us also to look at other organs in the, in the abdomen. And we're getting significant improvements in all this uh, uh, segmentation by learning again from, from the neighbors. But what I showed you here is that this, this, this was the first logical step that we had. We started with the liver because we thought the liver is the easiest one to segment. Then we moved to the spleen, then we moved to the kidneys. It's something that is, was done in a certain sequence that we define by, from, from experience. But what is interesting is that when you have something as big as the liver, of course, the entire liver is not going to interact with every organ in its neighborhood, but other parts of the liver are going to interact with different neighbors. And here, it, here there are these different partitions of the liver. The spleen will interact with liver 1 and 2, the uh, right kidney only with liver 4, and, and, and so on. So this is becoming a much more complex graph in which different partitions of different uh, organs talk to each other. So what we had to do for that is actually to find a way in which we can define these partitions, and for that we're going back to the idea of hierarchical shape models, and now we're working with the entire abdomen. So first, imagine the entire abdomen as being one object, and we model it together. This is a, a very low resolution representation of the abdomen. This is why it looks so abstract. Then we're increasing the resolution, and we're starting to cluster. 
And we see first that the left and the right are becoming apart. And then we move further and further to the organ level and inside the organ, and we can go as far as we want, and as long as it makes sense. And why is this important? Because first of all, here is the pancreas. We identify automatically mechanical deformations. This is again the head of the pancreas, the body, the tail. And we think that the way the, the, the statistical shape model uh, defines uh, this matrix allows us to tell what are the partitions inside an organ. And maybe also very importantly, or not, if not more importantly, we can now tell where the tail of the pancreas interacts with the kidney. So imagine that the pancreas is going to grow because of a pathology. You know exactly what's going to push against. If you cut part of an organ, that you know what's going to try to replace it over there. So now we know how these organs are going to um, uh, really interact with each other. Any questions? Because if not, I'm, I'm going to show you how we use something that we defined in this mathematical way to actually look at something completely different, genetic conditions and facial analysis. But first, gene action and effect. When you have a genetic condition, something is different, right? And very often, it's hard to put your finger on it. <clears throat> But to give you a few, a few uh, statistics about this, there are over one million live births in the world with a genetic condition every year. About half of these children, uh, these children account for about half of all pediatric hospitalizations because these are conditions that require very careful attention and about one in four infants still dies from uh, a genetic condition. But what's really interesting is that and there's a lot of anecdotal uh, data in this. One in three of these children is not identified early. And it's really important to identify these children early because half of them have cardiac conditions, about 80% of them have pulmonary conditions, they have developmental delays, and so on. So while the number of patients is increasing everywhere, the number of specialists is not growing. And I was just speaking with uh, one of the geneticists this afternoon at Mayo Clinic. And it's always surprising to know how well they all know each other all over the country. This is actually a small network of people that all know each other and work with each other. And uh, we are fortunate in the United States to have access to genetic uh, facilities. But if you look around the world, there are very few places that actually have great facilities, as shown here in green. Yellow is already pretty poor, and if you go to red, there's basically nobody to, um, uh, to see a child with, one, uh, with a chromosomal condition. And also, there's a high cost of testing, and untrained uh, uh, clinicians very often um, send children for you know, various reasons. They, they think something may not be right to be tested. This test can cost from about $1,000 to $15,000, um, uh, and they are not available in the vast majority of the world. So here is, the, here is a bit of the workflow that is uh, currently uh, applied in, in clinics for um, um, genetic screening. First of all, there is a prenatal screening with ultrasound, as you know. And if everything goes well here, there's going to be another screening at birth when every newborn is checked in detail. And everything goes well. You know, you're expected to live long and happy. But if anything is detected at any of these levels, then there is a long process of uh, clinical checkups, starting with you know, expensive blood tests. As I was telling you, you check the heart, the lungs, you have to check the visual and hearing systems, the development, the digestive system. The bonding with parents is something that has to be um, uh, starting very easy in life because this is something that actually has been shown that it's uh, a very detrimental um, both for the parents and the child if uh, it's not happening early. And if you have a child that is sick and you don't know what's happening over there, you may not know how to take care of the child. So if anything is missed at any of these points, then actually the cost of care for a child that is not identified early are much higher. So if, if uh, a child is born with Down syndrome, the costs 
during the medical costs during the lifetime of the child are about six to seven hundred thousand dollars. If the uh, uh, detection of the syndrome happens later in life, the costs go to over one million very fast. If you go to the clinical need, we know that we have screening mandates in the US and in the European Union and very other few places, but even that is done for about 20 conditions, which are mainly metabolic, out of the more than 7,000 conditions uh, uh, that have uh, chromosomal um, abnormalities. In the US, we have 4 million newborns every year. In the world, there are 131 million babies born a year. And again, one third of the children that have a condition may be uh, uh, missed. Of course, if we go into the developing world, there are no tests, there are no geneticists that are over there. And what actually I would like to show you is how pediatric world, uh, world looks in Uganda. And uh, this is a picture from one of my collaborators at, at the NIH. And uh, as you can imagine, there are not many uh, skilled clinicians uh, over there. This is why they, they get visiting clinicians to look at the kids. But very surprisingly, here's a picture from another one of my collaborators. They have state-of-the-art smartphones. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you in a moment why that, that, that's important because we can get a picture of a child. Here's a child with, with a genetic uh, uh, condition. But if you think that this is relevant only in Uganda, let me show what's happening in the United States. Again, going back to Down syndrome, because this is a condition that is more common, better studied, in a way almost easier to take care of. Born in the late 60s with so a Down syndrome, you'd be expected to live a couple of years. This has improved tremendously, it is getting better, so now a child born with Down syndrome in the United States is expected to live in the 60s or the 70s. But the discrepancy that you see over here, it's from whatever, uh, you know, you, you, we see an uh, ethnic discrepancy, which comes, of course, for also geographic conditions, but also socioeconomic conditions. And uh, for children that we see in Washington, D.C., at our hospital, where we have 14 geneticists, it's one of the largest genetic clinics in the world, we get children and their parents driving for hours and waiting for months to be seen by a specialist. So this is something that still creates a lot of need. In, uh, in the U.S. And some more facts about the U.S. I told you already that there are 4 million births. 1,120,000 of them every year are never screened for a condition prenatally. So when you think that every pregnancy is checked by ultrasound, by an OBG doctor, that's actually not the case. Moreover, prenatal ultrasound screening is 79% accurate only for Down syndrome. Down syndrome is one condition of the 7,000 that I was telling you about. Maternal blood test has very low uh, positive predictive value beside the fact that it's not used uh, universally. So what happens at birth? A clinician on the day the child is born can detect Down syndrome again only with 64% accuracy. This means that children are missed, but also we get about three times more referrals to genetic clinics than necessary which is extremely exp expensive and uh, uh, stressful for the families. So when a child, here is again a child with Down syndrome, comes to, to, uh, uh, to be checked, this morphology is one of the, the uh, first things that uh, a clinician will look for. And that's, you know, the shape of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears. This is the nuchal fold. Um, which is excessive in Down syndrome, extensibility and flexibility of, um, of the fingers, patterns on the hand, uh, flexibility of the, the, the body in general. So, while here on this child it's quite obvious that uh, there is Down syndrome, what I wanted to show you is actually what clinicians see every day. Here is a selection for uh, for the quiz of uh, newborns, and uh, I'll tell you the two of them have a condition and the other don't. Any guesses? Think Down syndrome. Think how well we all think that we can detect that. Yes, no? I hear a no? I hear a yes? <laughs> Uh, 
All right, and the winners. <laughs> or, well, let, let me start with this. So these, these kids are all born on the same day in the same clinic. And all of them were being discharged as being healthy. And we were there with a, with a specialist, actually, for, for one of our protocols. This kid has a condition. Would have been discharged on the day, got referred, because we were with a specialist, and then we ran some extra tests. This is a boy born in the Washington, D.C. area who went home from the maternity with absolutely no worry and had cardiac arrest at a very, very, very young age. At that point, the picture was returned to the um, commission at the Congress for Rare Diseases from where he got to our hospital, from where he got into our analysis, and it came out positive when we looked at, um, uh, at the records of that. So, I think that this is happening for one in 150 newborns in the U.S. who has a condition and about half of them has this, this morphology. So now I'm giving you, uh, again, a lot, I've given you a lot of background again to basically come to the point that the challenge that we have with this morphology is that we have to find that case in this crowd that has a condition. And this is when the technology that I showed you before actually converges with my story. Because we want to do identification of genetic syndromes using accurate, automatic, objective, and quantitative evaluation of facial dysmorphology. Because facial dysmorphology, and in general dysmorphology, is studied like in anything else in medicine. You take your caliper, and you take your ruler, and you start measuring things, like I showed you with the, with the child before. That's very subjective. And there are, there's no normative data from diverse populations. Because if you look for any textbooks in this morphology, they're all defined for Northern European populations. So every geneticist that learns how to look for Down syndrome, we know how to look for Down syndrome on a white child. That's not always helpful in other parts of the world. So what do we do? We use a technology that does facial identification and landmark location. Then we compute the phenotyping on the face, and then we use machine learning for classification. And to show you that actually I meant that this, this thing is related to what I showed you earlier, here are statistical shape models of multiple organs, like I showed you the abdomen before, but these are actually landmarks on, on a child's face. To the left, I'm showing you the model of the Down syndrome. To the right is the Down syndromic face. For those of you who may know a little more about these conditions, you see the eyes are getting further apart in this model than in this one, because that's one of the indications of Down syndrome. You have uh, the, the medial cantae apart. The nose is shorter here, because the length of the nose is shorter in those kids. Often they cannot close their mouth, so we pick this up in the model as well. But this is, again, this is a model that is based just on population studies, has nothing brought in that can bias the model, right? We know at in what regions to look, because we learned that from our clinicians, but everything else is modeled from populations. So our technology first identifies the face. Now every smartphone finds your face pretty well automatically, and actually we use some of that as well. We um, identify the landmarks. I showed you that the eyes, the nose, the mouth, also the shape of the face are important. We do all this automatically, and we do it with what's called an independent component analysis. And what an independent component analysis does, typically when you do shape modeling, you find a model that looks at the global variability on the face. And if you do that, you see that what the model picks up in, in, in this video, up, which I may not be able to show you again. Let me see if I can return to it. Unfortunately, you have to take my word for this that one model picks up local variations much better than the other, which picks global variation. Global variation thing, face is longer, face is wider. Here, eyes are further apart, nose is shorter. So then, we compute lots of features on, on these children's faces. Some of them are exactly what these morphologists would use. They look at the angles at the eyes, they look at the length of the nose, the distance between the eyes, angles of the mouth, and so on. The other thing is looking at texture on the face, and texture is bringing three-dimensionality from the 2D picture. The cupid bow just above your lip and the filtrum over here 
are very important in, in uh, this kind of uh, uh, diagnosis. So by looking at shadows and lines and patterns over there, we bring this three-dimensionality. We do then feature selection and classification because with machine learning algorithms where you don't have huge amounts of data, you want to do dimensionality reduction to prevent overfitting of the model. And then we use a classifier and like, you know, a classic classifier in uh, machine learning, supported vector machine, if you have two population, this is trying to find the best hyperplane, each one of these points imagine is multidimensional, yeah, it can have hundreds of features. You find a hyperplane that best separates them and enlarges the margin between the two groups as much as possible. And then we started looking finally at patient data. Our first study, we looked at Down syndrome, because again, Down syndrome is what I think it's easier to start with. And we had 50 cases with Down syndrome, about 80 healthy subjects, mainly Caucasian, very young, and we got an accuracy of 96%. Remember um, how a clinician was getting an accuracy of 64% on, on, on newborns. These are not all newborns, they're a little older, so maybe a little simpler. It's not a perfect comparison. But then we thought, well, Down syndrome is just one case. What happens to other syndromes? Then we got more cases with 15 different types of syndromes, more mixed ethnical background, and our accuracy stayed just the same. So this showed us that if we look at children, they look very different. These are not subtle cases, but I just want to show you some variability in the facial appearance. All these children have a syndrome. And here is a list of the syndrome that we're looking, looking at. We're actually getting results that show that our technology is as accurate as an experienced uh, uh, dysmorphologist. And we went back and we thought, how can we improve genetic references? And can anyone tell me what problem, if there's a problem with these genetic references? This is something published in 2008, pretty recent. What do these children have in common, or most of them? They're all white. And I just wanted to show you that even very, very recently, when we learn about the genetic condition, this is the kind of data that uh, this morphologist uh, gets to use. But the NIH created an atlas of human malformation syndromes in diverse populations, which was actually launched just last year. And they immediately partnered with us to look at how can we define these textbooks for children that come from different parts of the world. And this year, so one year after the launch of the Atlas, we published already three articles in the American Journal of Medical Genetics, one at Down syndrome in diverse populations, the other one in 22Q11 deletions, which is the DeGeorge syndrome, and the third one in uh, Luna syndrome. And now, as you can tell, a number of Co-authors on this is getting longer and longer by, by the article. And the last one, we couldn't fit on one page anymore because we get data from more and more countries. We get data from 20 countries uh, from uh, uh, four continents for, for this study. And in April 2017, we were on the cover of the journal, as you see here, and back in September. And if you read The Economist it was in, in September, uh, so just a couple of months ago, we were mentioned there. This is actually a very nice story about how facial analysis affects our society. It's not just about medicine, but also about security and toys and any kind of uh, level that uh, machine learning for face analysis uh, um, is impactful. So going back to Down syndrome for a moment. What I was very excited to see is, first of all, if we look at the identification of Down syndrome in general, in global population, we get an accuracy of 94%. If you know the ancestry of the child, the accuracy is increasing to 95, we see here, 98 and 100%. So by knowing where the child comes from and what ethnic background it has, we, we learn better how to detect uh, genetic conditions. So what came up? This is what our machine learning technology uh, identified, the significant features that identify Down syndrome in a population. Number one came the distance between the medial canti. Then we see the length of the nose, the slanting of the eyes, then texture at the cupid bulbs at the nose. This is pretty much like the textbook for 
the Caucasian, uh, uh, the textbooks on uh, identification of Down syndrome in Caucasian population. So we identified, but again, through mathematical modeling, that our algorithm thinks the same as the best geneticists. But then if we start looking at different populations where those textbooks don't exist, on our population of, of from Africa and African-Americans, the majority of them had upslanting palpebral fissures. That's your eyes are upslanted. And these are some of the features that came right at the top of our feature selection as well. Maybe more interestingly, all the geneticists agreed that if you're Asian, if you have Down syndrome, again, your eyes are upslanting. Our algorithm found that that feature is not relevant for Down syndrome because all the healthy children from Asia had that as well. So this is, of course, no big surprise, but if you look at the list of features between the different populations that are different. So this is telling a local geneticist how to identify Down syndrome differently in different parts of the world. We do the same for the DeGeorge syndrome. Again, we get better results the more we know about the ancestry of the child. We found here, when you look at the DeGeorge syndrome, the most common feature on the face between all the population, it's only 48% of these patients is nasal uh, anomalies. We find patterns from the nose everywhere. But then if you move to the African population, this is something where only 30% of the doctors found that they had nasal uh, anomalies, and actually there are a lot of uh, uh, publications that contradict each other about whether the nose is important or not. The not very clinical term is bulbous nose, if you have uh, DeGeorge syndrome. Actually, our <clears throat> um, algorithm again found that that's one of the significant uh, uh, features on the face. For Noonan syndrome, we have pretty much the same story. The most important thing to identify Noonan, and this is again not something so obvious, is that the eyes are apart. And we find both the difference between the medial cante, which is here, and the lateral cante to be the most significant features. Next, we're looking at Cornelia de Lange syndromes, Williams syndrome, Turner syndrome. These are the studies that are going to come up at the beginning of next year. And now that we have this knowledge, and I'll be very brief with this. The simplicity of using this technology, the technology is, is, is complex, is what will actually run it to be usable and to, uh, uh, to be applied in, in, in clinics. So what did we do for that? We developed an app that can be used to screen patients. So we detect facial <coughs> is morphology like I showed you before, and it can be done remotely. So it's again everything now the, the interface that the clinician has is just the app. You can take the picture and detect this morphology. So that's a wide range of genetic conditions that can help with the referral, reduce morbidity, reduce costs, and basically bring that knowledge that a, a, a virtual geneticist can have right next to the baby. And the technology looks like this. As you remember, we first find the face, then find the landmarks on the face, compute hundreds of features, then use a classifier, and we can tell if a child is at high risk or at low risk. We recommend referral or we recommend discharge. And this is just one test that we hope that we'll have at some point, not too far in the future, uh, part of the um, natal uh, uh, birth screening next to checking conditions of the heart, of the lung, looking at uh, pulse oximetry, and uh, uh, be uh, given as a resource to the clinicians. Of course, we think that this can be used in areas where some of the other uh, knowledge, clinical knowledge, is not available, like I showed you um, in this picture in Uganda, to accelerate diagnosis and, and treatment. And uh, for that, we partnered actually with a lot of, uh, with a number of institutions. Um, we have a big project with the UAE Ministry of Health and Prevention in Dubai. We have Georgetown and George Washington University Hospitals uh, in the DC area that work with us. University of Kinshasa has joined us recently. Of course, NIH and with uh, clinics from uh, 20 countries. And I'd like to finish this story by basically telling you that what's really important is how to bring this back to translation and how to take the technology to the clinic. 
and with this app here, it is used in a neonatal clinic in the UAE, where this app, again, has that mix between the art and science, I think, in, in, in medicine, and we have the technology that sits in the uh, uh, smartphone and the server behind it together with the clinician. We have our PhDs and MDs from Children's National that I'd like to thank for, for uh, this work, collaborators from NIH, also collaborators in Japan, in Spain, and in the UAE, and of course clinicians from 20 countries. And that's my story, and if you give me a couple of minutes, I'd just like to tell you a couple of words about EMBS. And this is again the Engineering and Medicine and Biology Society, which uh, has as uh, its logo Advancing Healthcare Through Technology. It's the world's oldest and largest biomedical engineering organization, and it has its roots you know, close to the uh, formation of IEEE as well. So it started uh, in 1948. There are more than 12,000 members, and more than 2,000 of those are students from 97 countries. And with many student chapters and student clubs, and we were talking earlier, actually, there is, there is a big growth that is happening in, in, in Asia, and uh, uh, we hope that we'll have some more growth here locally as well. We do summer schools, for those um, of you who know people who would like to, uh, to benefit from learning um, about uh, biomedical imaging, signal processing, biodesign, medical devices, IT, telemedicine and uh, journals. The, our signature journal is Biomedical uh, Engineering, Transactional Biomedical Engineering, which has been as, almost as old as the society, but also some of the, the, the meetings. David and I saw each other recently in Korea, in Jeju Island, 2018 Honolulu, and this is actually moving uh, uh, all, all around the world. It's going to be in Berlin in 2019. Um, also, technical committees. Uh, as David uh, mentioned in my introduction, I'm chairing the uh, Biomedical Imaging and Image Processing uh, Committee, but we have a number of them in all of the areas of interest of uh, EMBS. And, uh, of course, there is much more information that I invite you to, uh, to, to check on the web. And I'm happy to answer more questions about this, about any of the work. But first, I'd like to thank David for the invitation and, of course, EMB for, for sponsoring this um, uh, uh, presentation. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you for being here tonight. Questions from the audience? I have questions, so I might as well get started. So, uh, statistical shape modeling, do you, in your case, do you have to build a different model for every syndrome? Have you, did, have you started to look at, can you build a model that detects <coughs> different syndromes? So, for, for the study that I was mentioning as a textbook, there is a different model for every syndrome because that is looking at identifying only the patterns of that syndrome. For the screening, the model is for the general population and all syndromes. So, it's everything amalgamated together. And that's something that is actually really interesting that this morphology on the face has constant patterns, something constant in the patterns among different syndromes, different populations, and different ages. So when something is off, which I cannot tell, the, form, the, the modeling uh, uh, can do it. So that's one single model. Excellent, excellent. Other questions? Yeah. How many people are doing this kind of research? Well, according to The Economist, <laughs> um, there are mainly three groups. Us, the University of Oxford, and a company called um, FDNA. So, uh, um, that's also always something that, you know, uh, sometimes when I get, so what's the competition? Uh, Yes, maybe there is competition, but I think when you are such few working in a field, we'd better be collaborators than competitors, because otherwise we're not going to make those advances. Uh, there is a lot of facial analysis being done in, in, in the world, but I think the application at looking at this kind of... For instance, there, there, is, a, there is another um, 
group that is looking. So they, they do fashion analysis and they predict how you look based on your picture, how you look at a certain age, yeah. right? They say, I'm, yeah, I'm a man, I'm 25, which unfortunately is not my case, but this is, uh, this is how, how, how you look. Yeah. But it's a different application. Of course, in, in cybersecurity, there are, there are many other ways to look at this. So, so obviously you're, you're applying this to, to born babies, but and, and is, it, is there any application, I mean, is there any way to apply it to the, uh, the ultrasound type of an image? And, and the reason I ask is actually, we, we had a child that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, tick or hit so many check marks that we had, you know, the first ultrasound and the second ultrasound mm -hmm. and the third ultrasound looking for these, you know, Down syndrome type markers. Is there, is there a way that you could, you know, and again, I realize your your uh, resolution is very very limited at, from yeah. those ultrasounds, but but <laughs> ultrasounds are, are are getting better, and uh, actually, uh, uh, that's a very good question because we have looked a little bit uh, in, into that and got some sample ultrasounds from the next generation of ultrasound machines, which are not yet in in, in clinic, but that's what what is going next, and the resolution is superb. If you get the image right. If the baby is not, you know, sucking on the finger, nothing is turning like this. But what we could not get is sufficient data for that to make a study. So yes, we can do it because this we've already done studies on how this is, can be applied to three-dimensional photography. But to create those models for the pre-birth phase, which may have different characteristics, this is something we're, we're missing. And if you know of a center that can get that kind of data, it's not just me interested, but I also have a, a big company that wants to collect the data and to give up even the machine to do it. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's thank our speaker again.